Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Peggy Burhen and I am one of the master gardeners for the Slow Master Gardener program. And welcome to our advice to grow by. We're doing advice to grow by on Zoom. As you know, we used to be able to do this on um, in live and in person. Um, can't do that right now. So Peggy, I can't uh, hear you. You can't hear me. I'm not muted. Is that can anyone can everyone else hear me becky can you hear me i hear you fine yeah okay might be a problem with your um, microphone but if you can mute your line um and make sure that your your speakers are working just unmuted. yeah you're 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 unmuted so could you please uh, yeah, go ahead and mute your line denise um so i'll be moderating today's session apparently can't hear us thank, thank you yvonne um you know, thank you for muting um uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe you know what the best thing might be to do, Denise, is to go ahead and. Well, you can't hear me. Um, I'm going to type in the chat that you should um, sign off and sign back on again, and that might help. Um, okay, I'm going to send that to you. So, um, anyways, <laughs> there's always little glitches with Zoom, so um, we're going to be very excited. Uh, when we can go back in person. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, spring ahead in your vegetable garden. Um, Denise, if you can mute your line, please. Oh, this is gonna be a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, Wait, let, me, let me see, Denise, can you hear me? No, okay, go ahead. I thought maybe she could hear me. Oh. Um, how and why to start seeds and why to get how starting seeds now can get you a jump start on your garden, a head start. So that's our topic. And um, as I mentioned, um, be great if everyone can mute their lines if you haven't already. And uh, the best way normally to view the Zoom is to go into view and do side by side speaker. And then you'll see our speaker um, as well as her slides. Uh, without a lot of other folks um, in there. And please use the chat box uh, to send any messages um, if there's a problem or if you have a question, uh, we'll monitor the chat box. Um, Becky's gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then have time for questions. And I did put the evaluation link into the chat box. So uh, at the end of the program, if you can click on that link, I'll put it in there again. We do really appreciate everyone's feedback on the program. So we're looking forward to hearing what you thought of it. And so now without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Becky Zielinski. She's been in the agricultural business for nearly 30 years. So she comes to us with a lot of experience. She specializes in, in consulting uh, in agriculture, uh, including vineyard management, as well as ag training and education. And she's been gardening since she was a child. So we won't tell you how many years that is. <laughs> and it's about 20, right? Um, and she farms right now on an acre of her own property. She's got fruits and vegetables and flowers and herbs, and she grows 99% of that from seed. So we're anxious to hear from her expertise. And last year, she produced almost 2,000 pounds of produce, which she donated quite a bit to the uh, Echo Homeless Shelter. So thank you, Becky, for that. So she can tell she's been very successful. So I'll turn this over to you, Becky, and thank you very much for doing the program. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you for that nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I have to say it is kind of strange talking to myself. Um, so this will be, this is kind of my first time doing this and a learning experience um, for all of us. And actually, I want to take a moment to thank um, Peggy and Kim Morgan and um, Maria Marietta, um, our fearless leader at the Master Gardener program down in SLO, um, for being innovative and um, coming up with this, you know, new, new way to, to kind of uh, meet these challenges of our times and we can still um, share information and, and see one another without masks on, which is kind of cool. So, um, thanks, thanks to Zoom for that. So, you know, we can all sit, sit at home in our pajamas and learn, right? So um, I did get dressed though today, so I'm not in my pajamas. So I don't know about you, but anyway, um, so um, let's get started. Um, and uh, we saw the, the title slide and Peggy already gave you the name of my presentation. And so basically, um, 
there's a lot of reasons you, you might want to start your um, vegetable seeds indoors. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. Actually, this is my, 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 my I, I hear people talking. So anyway, if you've just joined us, if you could um, mute your microphone, we'd appreciate it. Um, so uh, anyway, didn't mean to get distracted there, but anyway, like I said, I think um, this uh, starting vegetables is fun. It's actually my my most favorite part of gardening. Um, to me, there's nothing more satisfying than than seeing a little tiny seed turn into a great big plant, and then it, with vegetables, um, you know, produce food that we eat and put on our table. I, I just think it's just totally amazing. So, um, so but other reasons. Um, to start vegetables in containers um, is you can get a, a head start on your growing season and you'll have a larger selection of varieties that you can choose from and it's um, cheaper of course than than buying plants there are a lot of seeds that they recommend can be direct sown uh, but for many others uh, they do rec you know it is recommended that you start them in containers and transplant them i do have um a handout or a link in this presentation that has a list of which vegetables they recommend for transplanting and which ones they recommend for um, direct sowing. And it's like anything in gardening, um, you know, these are all recommendations. You don't, you know, just because they recommend that you um, plant your tomatoes and peppers in containers doesn't mean you can't go stick a seed in the ground and it might come up and you might have a great plant, who knows? And likewise, they um, they recommend that you don't uh, seed cucurbits, um, or cucurbit, anyway, I was gonna say it wrong, but anyway, cucumbers and pumpkins and squashes, those sorts of things, they don't recommend those for uh, starting in containers, but I do, um, and it works quite well. So again, everything is relative. Um, as I go through this, um, a lot of the stuff, you know, these are my recommendations and based on my experience, as well as um, UC guidelines that have been given to us and other um, resources that I, I have relied upon over the years to help me learn what I'm what I'm doing. So um, if you know if you've always been doing something one way and it's working for you or your grandpa did it this way or Martha Stewart says to do it that way or whatever and and it's working for you um, by all means you know it doesn't mean that it's wrong or you know whatever like I said a lot of a lot of different ways to approach these things. These are just my recommendations. Um, so today we're actually going to focus on seeding tomatoes and peppers and I just want to show you so this little I don't know how well you can see it but I'm gonna put it right in front of the camera but this look this is a tomato plant and it's about three weeks old so I I do have mine going and then I just want to show you these this is another tomato plant and it's about a week old um, so you can see there's several in there then I, I'm showing you these two because I'm gonna make another point um, with them in a minute so um, anyway, so there are <clears throat> other, um, you know, reasons to, I, I just mentioned some of these things. Um, I, I didn't really, <laughs> anyway, there are, I, in my introduction, but here's, here's a list of all of those things. Uh oh, no, I'm okay. Oh no, I gotta find my back arrow. Sorry. There we go. But I did want to mention one other thing that's on this slide that I didn't mention before. Um, when we talk about getting a jump start, you know, getting your, you know, this, if you plant them in containers, um, it means that the plants will be ready when the weather is right for transplanting. And that's especially important in areas like Paso Robles in North County up here, where we're a little colder than the coastal, coastal areas and South County. Um, I uh, looked it up and last year, our last recorded frost date was April 17th. So, um, and I have actually been burned by this in the past several years ago. I, I actually purchased all my uh, tomato plants and put them out right around April 15th, I wanna say. So I, I thought the frost season was over and sure enough, we got a frost. I lost every single one of them and I had to go buy them again and set them all out again. So I do not put, pretty much i don't put much of anything out until around the first of may up here in past so um so that's just that's you know but 
what you are going to want to do is look at your frost date for your area and when you're getting ready to seed your plants um, you know you can calculate backwards from that um, one of the other reasons uh, for starting seeds in containers is like for uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, they're a little more difficult to propagate and they take longer. Again, if I had to wait until May to start a tomato plant from seed out in my garden, I, I probably wouldn't have tomatoes till Christmas. So um, so this way I can start my plants in, you know, even though it's February, I didn't start them till March this year. Um, but anyway, uh, there are reasons why you don't want to start them too early and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So again, just to reiterate some of the other reasons for doing this is you um, a lot more varieties to choose from, it's cheaper. You also get better control of your plant health. Um, not to say that um, plants from nurseries and, and stores are, are not healthy, but um, you just have you, you know, greater control over that if you do it yourself. And then lastly, you can grow the exact number you want. Say, you, you know, you want, you know, 10 tomato plants, but you don't want to spend, you know, $50, you know. So anyway, it, it's, so it's just another way of, of getting what you want. Um, so as somebody mentioned a few minutes ago, um, they had their seeds ready to go and, you know, uh, so it is time to get started. And I know most people, most of you are thinking about this right now. Uh, as I mentioned, excuse me, tomatoes and peppers are one plant that takes a little longer. They take usually at least four to six weeks before they're ready to, to go out. And like I said, I just showed you that three week old plant. Um, to me, they're much more finicky um, to even to get them to emerge some you know other vegetable crops are much easier to um, to grow in containers or even in the garden than these guys than tomatoes and peppers um, and I already had mentioned that um, here's the link I was talking about before and I they'll talk to you about how this presentation it's being recorded and you can see it again and I think they're going to make a PDF available so you don't have to worry about scribbling this down for um, but, uh, but anyway there is a vegetable planting summary that's available and it does list um, what plants are better suited for transplanting and as I mentioned that you know it's there those are recommendations so use them at your own will <laughs> So, um, so when when do you want to get started? So the the basically, like I said, you know, I'm going to look at your frost date. But uh, what you want to do is you want to start sowing your plants um, so that they can be safely transplanted outdoors shortly after germination. And again, uh, look at your last frost date. And um, you know, the reason I'm doing tomatoes and peppers first, like I said, they take longer. You know, I, I can have. I can have beans ready to go in a week or so. It's it's amazing how, how quickly some plants grow. Um, so th those will come next in, in my planting program. So it, like I said, there's other plants that even take longer, some other challenging plants. Um, you know, some plants can take up to 18 weeks to be ready for planting. Um, one of the other things you wanna make sure you don't do this too early um, because if you have to, hold them back let's say my tomatoes and peppers are you know ready and raring to go uh but it's still still there's a danger of frost out there i have to i have to keep them alive i have to keep them going and, until i can actually uh plant them and sometimes that you're doing that under poor lighting conditions or um not ideal temperature ranges so that can that can weaken your plants uh with time not to mention it's it's a lot of work keeping them alive and of course it depends on how many um you're doing i mean if you only have, have a few it's going to be and you can baby those it's not going to be as challenging for um someone that's trying to produce you know um several plants so So now we're going to talk about, uh, so what do the, what do, uh, plants need to properly germinate? And um, as you might imagine, um, the, the four things that they need, not only do they need these things, they need them in the appropriate amounts. And those are water, oxygen, light, and soil temperature. We're going to 
talk about each of those individually. Um, so this is how this kind of works. So uh, germination can't begin without water, without the little seeds absorbing the water. And an adequate, adequate continuous amount is necessary during the germination process to ensure that you get um, good germination. Oxygen. Um, you might not think that those little tiny seeds buried in your soil are breathing down there, but they are. Um, it's a very low respiration, but it does take place in all viable seeds. Um, the respiration does increase during germination, so your soil medium uh, must be loose and well aerated, so those um, seeds can, can uh, get some oxygen. Excuse me. Another Another good thing about Zoom is I actually got a cold a couple of days ago, and so you'll have to pardon me. I'm going to have to take a drink every once in a while, but we're still able to do this. Had we been in person, I would have to stay home. But anyway, um, so the, the next thing that you, um, the seeds need to emerge is light, and that difference differs for various crops. This, now I am actually talking about during the germination process. There are certain crops that do require light during germination. Actually, some require dark, and but most don't, don't require um, light requirements during the germination process. Um, doesn't really matter. Tomatoes and peppers are the, in the doesn't matter um, department. <clears throat> but once once those little guys emerge from the soil, they, they need light. So um, you need to either have you know, be ready with light available for them or, you know, um, anyway, they just know that they will, will need light once they emerge. Again, check different crop requirements for um, which crops require light to germinate and which ones don't. I'm not gonna really be going into that today, but I did again uh, provide you with a, a link down there and uh, where you can check. And this is actually, this one's quite Quite extensive. It lists almost every vegetable that uh, you know and what their light requirements are uh, during and after germination, as well as a lot of different information. I found that a, a lot of the plants that require light during germination are actually flowers. Um, I didn't. I don't know of too many vegetables that that do, but um, but lettuce is one. They, it need, they need light. Oh, no, actually, I said that backward. There's a lot of plant, the plants that require darkness are mostly flowers. So sorry about that. But anyway, check that side out. Um, and then soil temperature. Soil temperature is very important. And um, we'll talk about different ways to achieve this and monitor uh, the adequate soil temperature in a minute. Again, um, this varies by crop. Uh, what that uh, ideal soil temperature is and each plant has a range and one thing i have found is you know as long as you stay within that range it it can speed up or slow down your germination process so again if you look at a a packet of seeds like this you know and it tells you up here how many days to germination and it'll say 7 to 14 um, and then the optimal range for tomatoes is, you know, 65 to 75 or 65 to 75 degrees or whatever. If you, um, the colder the soil temperature, the longer your germination is going to take. So if you, you know, want to hurry them up a little bit, but still you have to keep within their ideal range. Um, if you make the soil temperature a little warmer, um, you know, that you can actually kind of speed up germination. So, uh, but again, favorable soil temperatures also affect the percentage of germination, um, meaning the number of your seeds that will actually emerge. Um, so again, a lot of seed packets uh, will put on there, you can't see them, but anyway, they do have on there their um, germination percentage. I try to find reliable seed companies that uh, have good germination rates, so. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, uh, so, so anyway. So, like I said, just stay within uh, the the range there of their ideal soil temperature. Don't go over it. And um, and if you're under it, they're they're not going to come up either. So so both are bad. <laughs> so think think ideal. <clears throat> think Goldilocks soil. So. Um, 
So again, here is a, a chart and a, there is a link to it in the references at the end of the presentation that shows the soil temperature conditions for seed germination. Um, and as you can see here, tomatoes, I don't know, you can't see my cursor. Okay, if you could see tomatoes, their optimum range is 65 to 85. But again, different varieties can be different. So um, always check varietal information whenever it's um, available. And as you can see, tomatoes um, don't want to be over 95. And sometimes when they're outside and if you have them outside and the sun is beating down on your little tray, you, you would be amazed how quickly that temperature can get up to 95 in your soil. And um, just so you know, we can see your cursor. So what you can use that as a pointer. Oh, you can. Ah, oh, look at that. Okay. I had it on my other screen. Okay. I, I couldn't see it. So, um, okay. Good to know. Thank you. So again, you can see there, um, peppers and tomatoes are about the same. Peppers don't like it quite as warm as tomatoes, but um, the 65 to 75, some tomatoes, can you can take them up to 85. But again, um, always, always check. All right. So now we're going to talk about seed selection. Again, this is a this is an addiction I have. I'm addicted to buying seeds. So anyway, that's, I'm trying to get over it, <laughs> but, but it's hard. So anyway, um, I I love everything about it. Reading about them, looking for them, finding the right one. So anyway, uh, but so but in general, you want to make sure that you only use high quality seeds purchased from a reliable dealer, and um, you want to select cultivars that are uh, suited to your growing area and your conditions. Seeds can be saved from year to year, but it, but you have to um, but they have to be stored properly. So it's best and it's recommended that you only buy what you need for the year. That's kind of impossible. I mean, when you know they you come with twenty five seeds and you need two plants, but so. Uh, We'll, we'll do another presentation on saving seeds some other time. But anyway, uh, but that's the recommendation. Um, you seed, seed companies do take a lot of care and obviously they're knowledgeable in how to process seeds properly uh, so that you do get good germination rates. And, and as I mentioned before, some companies do provide this information to you. Um, so if you do have it, you can also look and say, hey, you know, I, I don't want, you know, this guy's only, actually I got a seed packet earlier this year and they said they put um, twice as many seeds in it because it had a, a low germination rate so it's like oh okay that's nice of them but <laughs> so now i know i have to uh, start twice as many to to get the same number of plants so anyway um so yeah so that's uh some tips on seed selection um I don't, let's see oh i didn't mention this and i did want to mention that um you know, you can get them in stores. Uh, there's all, you know, you've seen all the one Burpee and uh, Lake Valley, it's the, how they have it farm supply. I mean, you, you've seen all the different seeds that are available in stores. There's nothing wrong with those seeds. I mean, they're good seeds and I've had a good deal of success with them. Um, but I do, I do purchase most of my seeds online because I do like to buy seeds that, um, I used a lot of hybrid seeds and I, I like to know, um, well, for instance, um, you know, some seed companies, they have a lot of information on their websites, you know, in their catalog about growing conditions and their ideal growing conditions and all sorts of information. So I just prefer to buy mine online so I can be a little bit more picky about what I'm getting. So not that I don't occasionally pick up seeds at stores because like I said I just can't help myself so anyway um, <laughs> so to uh, save or purchase that that's a decision uh, you'll have to make for yourself and um, there's some pros and cons to both uh, saving seeds of course it's cheaper um, it's certainly easier with some vegetables than others um, Kind of a, a bad thing is if it's not done properly um, the seeds can carry diseases or not be viable you also cannot save hybrid, you can't save seeds from hybrid plants. Um, uh, there's a little bit more time and effort involved in um, saving your own seeds, because like I said, they must be cleaned, dried, and, and stored properly. 
and this is it, this is my opinion only. Um, I think it requires uh, some experience uh, to get good results. I, I just feel like I have better results from from purchase seeds. So um, again, but there's pros and cons to purchasing your seeds. Um, they are generally guaranteed to be disease free. You get pretty consistent results uh, from purchased seeds. You get the um, you can buy hybrid seeds so you can get the benefits from hybrid and we're, we're going to talk about what a hybrid is versus an heirloom in just a sec sec med. okay time for a drink just a second um <clears throat> so uh anyway you can get the benefits of, of hybrid seeds you get a greater um selection you know if you're only using save seed you're going to obviously be growing the same plants every year whereas if you buy seed you can you can experiment or you know, buy some other types of um, varieties of, of tomatoes or peppers. So, uh, as I mentioned, I use a lot of hybrids and I just like uh, the guarantee that my seeds are going to be disease free and whatnot. So, um, I prefer to purchase. I have grown plants from Save Seed, but um, I just, like I said, I have better success with uh, purchased seeds. So that's just me personally. That's so. All right, so as promised, now we're gonna uh, talk about the difference between hybrid or heirloom seeds. And um, first we'll talk about what they are. And I'm not, I'm not actually gonna go into this um, real deep. This would be a, a better subject for um, a propagation um, segment. Um, so maybe that one will happen too, but anyway. Uh, so hybrid seeds versus, versus heirloom seeds. Um, basically hybrid seeds, those are seeds that have been developed by plant breeders and they have been purposefully crossed to create plants with unique or, and or desirable characteristics such as disease resistance, um, greater productivity, color, um, you know, or growth habits, uh, things like dwarf plants and, and that sort of, sort of things. Um, they sometimes can be more expensive. I don't really find it that they're that much more expensive, but um, again, that was um, mentioned in the book. So like I said, you might want to just check for that. But anyway, they can be more expensive, but they generally have better vigor and uniform uniformity and productivity because when the breed, that's what breeders are trying to select for. They're trying to select for those traits that, you know, make this tomato grow stronger, longer, you know, better sort of thing. Um, and again, with uh, tomatoes and peppers, hybrids are can be important because if any of you have grown tomatoes and peppers, especially tomatoes, you know that there's um, there's a lot of diseases um, in, in tomatoes that you have to deal with or a lot of things that can come up. So with hybrid seeds, you can actually buy um, seeds with disease resistance and there can be different ones, um, different types of resistance packages. So uh, with tomatoes, there is a code. Um, if you buy, even if you're buying your plants at the store, you can look at the, the tag of the tomato and it will tell you, um, you know, if it has disease resistance like F1, um, which is Fusarium 1. So, um, and, and seed companies will give you that same information. So if, if you, like I said, if you've had issues with diseases with your know, tomatoes in the past, that's something you might wanna want to look at. So um, peppers can be the same way, although I, I don't seem to have as much disease um, and fungal issues and things like that with peppers as I do with tomatoes and even some other plants. But, uh, but anyway, so that's hybrid seeds. So heirloom seeds, again, uh, what, what they are is those are open pollinated varieties. Um, that means that those characteristics of those plants are being, you know, um, cultivated and carried out by things like insects, wind, or, you know, other natural pollination processes. Uh, so basically their characteristics are not produced or controlled by, you know, a laboratory process. So some people like that because it um, maintains genetic diversity. So, and so that's a one benefit to heirloom. Um, 
generally the the offspring will be similar to its previous generations, but generally they're not exactly the same. So again, that's kind of what what you get with an heirloom. You're you're kind of getting its evolution, if you will. Um, there are some vegetables that can cross pollinate too, and again, that's um, like melons and things like that. So um, you can you can deal with that with heirloom seeds some sometimes, but mostly it comes through you know if you, if you save the seed. So again, that that's something you have to kind of be mindful of. So that's what they are. Um, again, uh, here's some more differences. Is um, like I said, you can't. You can't save hybrid seeds because uh, they will not breed true. That means that um, that disease resistance that that seed had on your, your tomato seed, um, if you save that seed, it won't necessarily have it next year. It might, but it might not. So there's no guarantees. Um, so again, the growth habits and the other character characteristics won't be the same if you um, save the seeds. And um, like I mentioned before, the one of the other um, differences is you can get a variety of disease resistance with hybrid seeds. Um, with heirloom seeds, some of the, you know, again, just the differences between the two types of seeds, I'm, I'm not, I grow both, so I'm not dissing one over the other. Um, but heirloom seeds are valued for their unique characteristics, um, but on the, the con side, they uh, do not generally have disease resistance, but they can. I actually found a, a beefsteak tomato or a big beef from Renee's garden this year. It's an heirloom tomato and it has some disease resistance. So um, so anyway, they say that heirloom, heirlooms may not be as productive as hybrid counterparts, but I haven't really, with tomatoes, I have not found that to be the case. My heirloom tomatoes can produce quite well. So under ideal conditions, of course. <laughs> so, uh, but that goes with anything. Um, so again, where to buy your seeds? I'm sorry, I'm being a little redundant here. Got ahead of myself a minute ago, but um, like I said, there's many sources in stores and online. Um, as I mentioned before, store bots are okay, but the selection is more limited and uh, may not, you know, those burpee seeds at Lowe's may not have been really, um, specifically suited for California growing conditions. I have found that most seed companies are back east, so um, it, it's hard to find uh, seed companies on, on the west coast. There are some, but um, the, most of the big ones are not. Um, as I mentioned before, some of the seed um, sources are more helpful than others. Um, for instance, and I'm, you know, sorry, I'm gonna drop this name just as I, I do use them a lot. So Johnny's Seeds Online, it's just, it's a, they just provide a great deal of information on their, their plants and their seeds uh, on their website, on their seed packages. Um, they actually have a grower library, they have tutorials online, and they even have a helpline. You can actually call and speak to a person and they will really, they will really talk to you and or call you back. It's pretty amazing. So I, I am, I, you know, I use other seed companies, but I, I do like that one quite a bit. Um, so now I will have to say during COVID, most of these seed companies are pretty overwhelmed and things are taking a little longer. And um, there have been, um, at one point, Johnny's had on their website that they weren't selling to home gardeners. They were only selling to businesses, but then they, they lift those restrictions. And anyway, so then I had another seed company said it was taking them, oh my gosh, eight weeks to ship out seeds. So again, the, things are kind of crazy right now. Better this year than last year, but they're crazy. So um, now we're going to talk about what, again, this goes back to what I was saying about where you buy your seeds from. Um, you know, what do seed packets tell me? Well, I just gave you a couple of examples here, a um, couple of different companies, and, you know, you can just... Uh, I'm sure you've looked at enough seed packets to know that they they just provide you with with different information. And like I said, I, I like to use use the companies who provide me as much information as possible. But at a minimum, they usually do provide you. Well, so this one has it over here on the side. They give you how deep to plant the seeds. Um, that one even this one even gives you heat. Uh, 
see temperature, which is, is good. Um, but some of these other ones, they basically give you days to germination and, um, you know, a few other things. Uh, so, again, just, you know, look at your seed packets and um, – you, you can learn a lot of learn a lot of things you need to know to to plant it and and as I mentioned before even within the tomato family these are all different tomatoes um, you know uh, different germination rates and slightly different temperatures in general tomatoes are going to germinate at seventy to seventy five degrees somewhere in there no matter what but again you can um, find uh, specific information to that variety that you're planting on your seed packets. So, um, most also include the planting depth and um, some will include like pH requirements, the soil temperature and all of those things. So, um, you can get a lot of information from your seed packet. So, um, you're all excited, right? Ready to get, ready to get started. So, um, let, let's talk about uh, what you're going to need. And, and, you know, in reality, you, you could do this pretty, pretty minimally. I mean, I know a lot of people use, you know, egg cartons and uh, cups, paper cups, plastic cups, whatever. You know, all of those things are fine. Again, these are recommendations. And if you're going to, you know, use other methods, just, you know, make sure you um, check them out and, and you know what you're doing. There are some basic things that you need to do no matter what tools and supplies you're using. But, um, but if you are going to use homemade containers, just make sure they have drainage holes. That's that's pretty important. So um, I use um, wh what is recommended is actually um, shallow or small pots and seating trays. As you can see, this this is a, a solid tray right here. It has no holes. This tray right here has holes in it. Um, I use both because I, when you get to watering down below, I, I just lift this tray up, water underneath, and then I don't have to lift up every single little pot or, or six pack. Um, you can also, you know, use the, the peat pots. Um, those work well too. Obviously you can't reuse those. And um, I, I, I don't know, I've just kind of gotten away from it um, from peat pots for various reasons. But anyway, lots of people like them and you can use them. Um, and here's another, this is just a two, two inch pot and a, a tray system. This thing is a humidity dome. Um, and those are important. Um, this one actually is a two inch one. Uh, I have found, I just put it here, just worked better in the picture. You, you will notice that it has some ventilation holes in it. Some of them don't. I highly recommend the ones with ventilation holes and they are more expensive, but I also like the taller ones. I have taller ones because they ventilate better and uh, the plants can get a little bigger in them, but they're more expensive. So these are all, all trade-offs. Um, so, and then of course you're gonna need some sort of um, shelf or somewhere to set your seedlings in your pots. Um, I have a picture I'm gonna show you, but I, I have use an inexpensive uh, wire garden shelf. I actually do start uh, most of my seeds at this time of year, my tomatoes and peppers, I actually start in my house. I, I have a greenhouse, but it's even a little too cold out there for, for them when I start them. So um, I bring this wire shelf in and I uh, my heat mats and lights and stuff in uh, to my guest room. Uh, so y you can also use a, a cold frame and I have never used a cold frame, so I'm not gonna talk about that because I don't really have much information for you on it. So, um, and again, I, for me in Paso, I think it would be a little too cold to try to seed tomatoes and peppers inside a cold frame, but correct, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. So anyway, so there's some, that's uh, it's a few of the tools you need to get started. Here's a few more. Some of the basic stuff you can see down here, you're gonna need um, a watering can and, um, and oh, I didn't put it in the picture, but you're gonna need a spray bottle or a, a mister. I actually have a pump spray bottle that I, I use so that I'm not constantly doing this and the other kind of spray bottle. Uh, plant markers are important. Um, 
This is also the, a little hand garden fork. This is what I use to mix my soil. Gloves, um, want to make sure you wear gloves when you're handling the, the soils and, and fertilizers if you're using them. And this thing here, and I have it here too, I'm going to show you. It's one of my favorite tools in the garden. It's called a dibbler. I don't know if you have one, but if you don't, highly recommend it. Um, it's it's great as I want to I'm going to put it in front of the camera because you can see it's got markings on it so that's depth markings that's an inch two inches three inches um, I use this for seed starting you see it's got a little point there so you can push the seeds down with it and then I just kind of after a while you kind of know where's a where's an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch you know so I, I can see kind of what I'm doing um, I also on, on the side I also use this for transplanting it's pretty neat because again you have the the depth markers but you know you put this in the hole and you just you kind of turn it like this and it just makes a perfect hole so anyway I again look it up a dibbler you can get them online um, so I really like those. So here's my um, homemade um, light shelf. I have looked at life sh light shelves online and they are quite expensive. Um, so I, I make my made my own. This little shelf here I, I ordered online from from Walmart or wherever and um, they're about 50 bucks or whatever. As you can see I have uh, infrared light. I have lights up here and here you can see one of my um, taller domes. Those are seven inches uh, and they're also ventilated. So, and I have heat mats. So I have my heat mats and my lights and I attach them to this tray. And that's, that's my inexpensive um, light table as you know. So instead of it being a thousand dollars, this probably 30, 60, I don't know. This probably costs um, all together for, I have four sets of heat mats and lights in there. <coughs> Excuse me. So eh, maybe roughly a couple hundred bucks. But anyway, that's a lot. You probably don't need four sets. But um, but anyway, but you can make your own light table. Um, let's see. You are going to need, um, like I said, a good light source once the plants emerge. And um, windows... Generally, they say to put them in front of a sunny, sunny window, but it's generally not enough light. And then there's this something called the heliotropic effect. And this is what I want to show you. And I haven't moved too much yet, but these are the little plants I showed you before. And I don't know if you could tell, but I put them next to the window and they're already, they're already leaning towards a window, towards the light. And that's what's going to happen is your little seedlings are going to stretch too much and and bend over trying to get to that light from your window. So um, it's just not not ideal. Last year, I actually I made a little time lapse video on my phone <laughs> of, of the little plants reaching for the light. It's kind of amazing how, how quickly they they bend over. So um, after the seeds emerge, most most crops need at least 12 to 16 hours of, of light a day. So again, um, lighting lighting is important. Not that you can't take them and set them out in the sun, especially if you're in a warmer climate. You you can do that, but you're probably going to need to bring them in at nighttime. So just make sure their light source is over their head. Uh, they generally recommend about six inches above the plants if possible. So. Um, as you can see, mine's a little taller uh, to accommodate for my taller domes. So everything's a trade-off. <clears throat> so you know we're at about the 45-minute mark. Not that we're in a big hurry, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. Oh, uh oh. Okay, let me. Um, let's see. I don't think uh, we're restricted. Well, uh, I'm not well, sure if some people will have to leave or not. So I just want to make you aware. Okay. Well. Then, uh, since since they're going to make this presentation available, I'll just kind of hit the highlights here. Um, the other thing you're going to need is a proper growing medium. Again, I've given you a lot of resources on that and a lot of information about seed starting mixes, and it's on this. So you can um, – anyway, I'm sorry. I have to uh, – go through this too quickly. But anyway, long story short, just make sure you're using a seed starting mix of some sort. Don't use soil. Uh, don't use potting soil. It's too dense and don't reuse old potting soil to start seedlings. It doesn't work very well. So uh, too much risk of disease there. Um, there is something called a germination mix, which is um, especially extra light. Um, 
for and it's better suited for small seeded crops but and then but then there's a lot of seed starting mixes um again you can buy those at the at uh, landscape or what am i trying to think of hardware stores <laughs> or again online or walmart wherever uh i have some information on growing mediums if you want to make your own actually uh, for most of my seedlings that i do i do a mixture i of a third a third a third of peat moss vermiculite and um perlite and i did explain in this presentation what that is but i won't go into that um i do want to mention real quick that uh they both have different properties uh the perlite the white stuff is actually it's to aerate and for um help water drainage vermiculite is like more like a little sponge and it's for water retention so you need kind of need both um and uh, don't you know don't use don't use too much of those. Uh, some some seed mixes have something called mycorrhizae in it, and again, I, I won't um, spend too much time on that. But basically, it, it can help uh, with uptake of nutrients and increase uh, production, and helps with disease resistance and things like that. I don't use it on all my seeds, but um, again, tomatoes and peppers, since they're kind of finicky. I, I like to have that in there. So it's something you check on the label. Um, so we already kind of talked about this, when to sow your seeds. So I, I won't rehash that one. We'll skip and we'll just go right to the, the steps. And again, I'm sorry, I have to go through these kind of quickly. Uh, important things. No, don't, you don't rush too much. I'm sorry, Becky, don't rush too much. I just wanted to let you know the time. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, I, I, you know, I don't want people to have to, to, to miss it. If, and it, um, there's questions at the end, maybe we, we can go back. Um, so if we have time for questions, that is. So uh, so here's the how-to steps. So I think this is important. So I would like to spend a little bit more time on this. Um, basically, the first step is to sanitize, um, especially if you're doing this from year to year. If you're buying all shiny new toys and trays and things like that, it's not quite as important, but definitely make sure that you sanitize your work area, your tools, your containers, especially if you're reusing them. Um, they recommend a, a, a bleach solution, a 10% bleach solution to uh, clean your containers. I actually put it in like just a regular garden sprayer and I lay my stuff out and I spray it with the bleach solution. <coughs> so it beats kind of hand washing. I found that works pretty good. So, but do both sides and do it clean everything. Uh, you're going to want to gather all your seeds and supplies. And uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to um, moisten that potting soil. Again, depends on when you bought it, but a lot of times it's kind of dry. So you just want to add enough water so that when you squeeze it, it, um, it holds together pretty easily, uh, but, but no water should come out. Then you're going to want to fill your little containers uh, with the growing medium and place them in the trays or whatever it is you're using. And um, just want to make sure that all of your pots are have you know consistent and, and level. So um, consistency is is the key. I just if you have everything at the same level, that it's just easier, um, you know, to to keep to know what's going on. <laughs> um, Next, you're going to want to sow your seeds. Uh, you want to place the seeds in the medium, and I just do this by hand. I've tr I've tried all sorts of tricky little seed thingies, but um, anyway, my hand just works the best. Um, most of the seed packets will have recommendations, you know, of how many to put in the hole. You can put uh, two to three. Again, it kind of depends on the germination rate if they gave you that information. Um, I also a lot of times. Um, and again, another bad habit I have is because I can't stand killing plants is I pull these little guys out and I reseed them. I put them in another pot, but I'm trying to stop. I have too many plants. So anyway, um, so, but if you put them all in the same hole, they're going to come out like these guys all close together and then you're going to have to thin them out. And I just want to show you. So if you're just real careful, uh oh, I pulled this little head off. But anyway, you just are going to have to carefully, um, yeah, just if you just pull a little plant out, see and see has a long little root he already has. He's only a week old, and again, if you repot that guy, he'll live. So, um, 
So you wanna sow your seeds, you can put them all in the same hole, make sure you do it at the right depth. Uh, so press them into this, the medium. Again, that's, I use my, my dibbler, so I know what I'm doing. I actually, I, um, I put the seeds on top of the soil and I just press them in, or you can actually make the holes and then put the seeds in, however you wanna do it. Uh, but most importantly, now you have to cover the seeds, but with just a very small amount of the same growing medium. So you just wanna cover them and now you want to water them, um, but just very lightly uh, over the top. You just want to, um, and you're going to want to keep the tops moist uh, until the seedlings emerge. And if you do this right, hopefully you shouldn't have to water them too many more times if you're using the humidity domes and things like that. Uh, but anyway, like I said, mist them lightly over the top, add warm water to the bottom of the tray. Uh, I don't, about an inch is recommended. Again, I just make sure that the bottom of the soil, um, the bottom of the pot is in the water. And then what happens is the soil absorbs that, that water. Uh, so, and again, it's just enough to saturate the soil without making it too wet. Um, next, you wanna cover the tray. Um, and again, you don't have to, you can do this without covering, um, but it's, it's recommended. So the ventilated humidity domes, uh, it helps, uh, maintain a more constant moisture. It does help with uh, retaining the warmth and provides some humidity. Um, maintain the temperature. This is again, very important. Back to that chart that I showed you. Um, check your temperature, use a heat map. My heat map have a soil uh, temperature probe, which um, is for best results because it'll regulate that temperature but you can also just use these because I don't do everything on heat mats. And if, I, if I'm sowing in my greenhouse, I just use a little temperature probe and I, I check the soil temperature that way if I'm not using mats. Um, like I said, keep your flats and pots out of direct sunlight as that can increase the temperature um, more than you think and um, will harm the seed. You're gonna to wanna to maintain the moisture, as I mentioned, just to keep them moist on top, because if the top of the soil crusts over, the little seeds can't break through. They're determined little guys, but um, you know, if it, the soil gets too crusty on top, they can't break through. So um, mist them if necessary. Um, then provide the appropriate amount of light during germination, if that's required. And again, here's a, oh, over here is a heat mat and a, a, a temperature sensor, and that's a little probe that goes into the soil. So I use those. Again, they're available all different kinds online, and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, so once the little guys emerge, um, you're gonna wanna make note when you start, I keep, you know, keep notes. I have a, I track mine on a spreadsheet and when I planted them and, you know, tomatoes seven to 14 days generally. Um, I got pretty good emergence as you can see on, on this one. Um, and, and in a week, I was amazed. They came up really quick this time. Um, now they do require the light 12 to 16 hours a day. Uh, at this point, you want to remove the domes, and now you want to start watering these guys from below. And again, just keeping the soil most moist, not not too saturated. So, um, after their first true leaf, uh, you can see. I don't know if you can see on this little guy. These these are the cotyledons here. These two guys. But once I get that first true leaf in there, uh, they're going to need some sort of fertilizer. This. Uh, Seed starting mix is generally pretty sterile, meaning it doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. So recommended is just a, you know, uh, everyday, whatever kind of liquid fertilizer you want to use and just, you know, use it to um, the package directions. And um, so, yeah, give them, give them a little shot of fertilizer. You're going to want to thin them to one plant per pot, like this guy, that's this guy's all thinned and fertilized and happy. Um, keep them in an area that's about 50 to 55 to 60 degrees at night and no more than 70 during the day. Again, can be a little challenging outside, but that's what's ideal. Um, and then at this point, if you're going to pot them up to keep them in a pot longer, especially if you're using the little six pack cells, you're probably gonna wanna pot them up. And at that point, if I pot them up, I actually move them into potting soil which does have some nutrients. And I usually add 
I usually add vermiculite and perlite to my potting soil. Again, I just want it to be a a little better aerated than what I can buy at the store. And I, I add um, a dry fertilizer to the potting mix at this point, because if I'm potting them up, it means they're going to be in there a little while. Um, here's a sheet on here, and I'm not going to go over all of these uh, transplant disorders. Uh, you can look this up. Um, it's a uh, this, this book actually happens to be one of my husband's um, uh, soils books uh, from Davis when he was getting his bachelor's degree. So so my version's a little old, but there are newer versions online. But anyway, it's still good information. It's called Knott's Handbook for Vegetable Growers. And um, anyway, this talks about possible diagnosis and correction of transplant disorders. Um, so I found that to be helpful. Um, then lastly, the um, thing you're going to need to do with these little guys is you need to harden them before you put them um, out in your garden. And the objective of hardening your transplants is to slow their growth, to prepare it to withstand the less than ideal conditions you have provided for it <laughs> up to this point. And so it can handle the stress of outside um, extreme temperatures, drying winds, low soil moisture, root injury during transplanting, any of those things. Um, so basically the method is to restrict growth in some way. You can do it by um, decreasing water, um, exposing plants to lower temperatures. Um, you don't, don't fertilize before you uh, start this hardening process. They say that using a combination of those methods is, is the best way to go, you know, not to like severely restrict water and give it fertilizer. I mean, you know, so you wanna, excuse me, use a combination of those things. And then seven to 10 days is usually sufficient. And um, the other thing to know is just don't, like I said, don't restrict, don't make the hardening so severe that they get over hardened because that can be problematic too, can reduce your yields. So that's all I have folks. Happy tomatoes make a happy garden. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know, Peggy, do we have time for questions or I what? Have, I think we do and we have a lot of questions. So um, I'll read through them on the chat. And uh, I did put in the links, all the links that were on your slides, I put in the chat box. So those of you that are listening, if you would prefer to grab those now um, <clears throat> instead of uh, waiting until the, um, uh, it's till it hits our, our website where you can access those. I'm also going to um, put back in the chat box at the bottom here, the evaluation link so that everyone can um, go ahead and, and click on that. So uh, first one quick question is what kind of lights are you using? Are those infrared or do you have, is it a broad spectrum light bulb um, for plants? They, they call them full spectrum. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And they seem to work fine, although um, the I am they they were a little more inexpensive. But I I believe that the the white lights, but they still have to be full spectrum. But I think the white ones work a little better. But that's just my my two cents. So All right, and then someone uh, up in your area in Paso, she wants to know uh, is the, the east side of the Salinas River versus living on the west side of the Salinas River in the city of Paso. Is there a difference with frost? Uh, she's heard that the river has an influence on the moisture and the precipitation. Do you have any um, information on that? Um, well, there, yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily the river that makes the delineation of, of the change, but there's definitely different climatic conditions and soil conditions on all actually it's all over Paso and it's it's really not an east-west thing and the only reason I say that is because that was a battle we had to fight in the viticulture industry a long time ago in Paso Robles and a lot of studies have been done on the soils and the temperatures and when they were creating the AVAs so anyway I, I know that there are differences in temperatures all over the Paso Robles area but I, like I said, in, it's not an east side, west side thing. Um, if you go to the Weather Underground, they have um, they have different people that have different weather stations all over. You know, you can get information from them that's more specific to your area. But um, I just happen to have a weather station. Uh, it's just it's kind of one of the things we do. But anyway, so um, 
just just watch the weather in your area and um, see if you can find some historical data for your area. But the most important thing is your last frost date. And that April 17th date was Paso Robles just in general. It wasn't for a specific area. So. Yes, I've often heard there's quite a few microclimates in Slow County, even uh, <laughs> South County, yes. North County. So you kind of have to know your area. Um, yeah. Someone is asking what kind of soil you recommend, but you've already answered that question in how you mix your um, your soil. And I also put the link in the chat for that you sent for the oh. UCA and R. Uh, um, and oh. then someone wants to know, um, how do you know which plants need four weeks versus 18 weeks in terms of germination? Is that on the seed packet? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, how do they know which plants are gonna need four weeks versus 18 weeks of germination? Is this information on the seed packet? Yes, Okay. yes it is, yep. Um, and, um, actually one of those charts I gave you too. Okay. It, it's on those as well. Okay, I put the links to those charts in as well. Um, someone is saying that they use half gallon milk containers as little mini greenhouses when they uh, take their plants outside um, early. So they can take your plants outside earlier. Is that okay protection or how, what do you think about that? Oh, do you mean to like, cover them with them? Yeah, I think they leave the top open and you know, you put the, you cut off the bottom and put the plastic milk container on top of a small plant. Um, well, it's probably better than leaving them unprotected. Um, I don't find, I mean, I have done that in the past. I don't find that it provides too much protection. If you're wanting to put them out earlier and try to protect them from frost, I would recommend uh, floating row covers. And you can look that up online, just uh, Google floating row cover. And um, there's different places you can get it. Basically, it's uh, it's a cloth. It's a white cloth. It comes in varying um, degrees of how much temperature or light it lets through. Uh, I actually use it in on my lettuce most of the time up here in Paso because I can grow lettuce later with a little bit of shade for it. But anyway, it, <laughs> it could do a variety of things. But anyway, I would recommend floating row cover you just you put little can put little hoops in the ground and then you attach it and it actually provides better um, temperature and frost protection than plastic okay and maybe keep some aphids and uh, other bugs off your plants too yes that too yep. um, someone is asking if you have a seed company that you've had success with for north county but i think you might have covered that and you also mentioned you know you've had great success with johnny's but is one seed company have any seeds that you think are more appropriate for north county more appropriate for north county um no, because like I said, it's I, I to me the finding seeds produced uh, specifically for the West Coast are difficult. There is a seed company up in Washington State that I discovered last year. It's called Osborne Seeds. I don't have one anyway, but look up Osborne O S B O R N E. Like I said, they're up in Washington State, um, but they do also you know sell seeds all over you know. Okay. For, all, for different places, but they are producing the seeds on the West Coast. So you really just have to kind of read about them and um, look for a seed company or on their sites if they give you hardiness zones or um, things like that. Um, again, a lot of seed, they will tell you, you know, this seed is ideal for hot weather or below this latitude or, or whatever. And so, so that's what, that's what I look for. Um, again, the, um, the more generic, I don't want to call them generic. That's not a good word to use, but the more popular seed companies like, like um, Burpees and Lake Valley and Renee's garden. I mean, those are just more generic and I think they're designed to grow just about anywhere. And again, I've, I've had, I've had good luck with them, so. Um, no. well, someone, someone wants to know what's your favorite tomato variety. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's like picking your favorite child. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of favorite, favorite to grow, favorite to eat, <laughs> favorite. To, um, I uh, I don't know. Um, what have you had the most success with in North County? Hmm. Most success with. 
well, sun gold cherry tomatoes grow like crazy. Those are <laughs> those are easy to, to grow. Um, let's see. I've had, I had equally good success and bad success with some of the same varieties. Uh, but uh, let's see. I like to grow Roma tomatoes. I'm trying to think. I'm kind of put me on the spot. I'm trying to think. Okay, that's okay. I mean, I think the sun golds are great, and they grow great for me here in South County too. So that's that's a that's a winner. Um, yeah. Someone else wants to know. Um, they got mushrooms in their tomato this year, and they um, may, yeah, they may have used old soil when they potted them up. But do you think that's what it is? Uh, and more importantly, will they be fine? <laughs> Well, uh, more than likely it did come from the reused soil. Um, and I, yeah, I would just remove them and, you know, I mean, fungi in general is, can be helpful to your soil. So as long as it's, you know, not crowding out the plant or making the, the soil too, you know, uh, decay, you know, what it does is breaking down the soil. So I, 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 I don't know exactly, but I, I would assume if you pulled them out, they should be okay. Okay, and then uh, can they soak the seeds before planting them in the garden? Someone is saying they have butternut squash and honeydew melon and some others. They're wondering if they should soak them. Yeah, there are methods for for doing that. Um, beans also work quite well. Again, just in a moist paper towel, you know, you moisten the paper towel and put the seed, lay the seeds out on it and um stick it in a ziploc bag um you can you know those harder coated seeds i think you're gonna have a much harder time um with those perhaps uh than you do uh, you can even do that with tomatoes and pepper seeds but um like i said i i don't know i've never tried it with those the harder seeds but i'm i'm assuming you you could do it you might just have to wet them more often or maybe a little bit bit more so yeah, I've heard that on beans as well, that it's it's good to kind of proof them, if you will, and get them started uh, in the the wet paper towels. Yeah, that's how I do it. You know, yeah, okay. I you can put it in a shallow tray with some water on it and, and cover yeah. it. I mean, um, but I again, I, I pot those. So I just, I stick pots. I, I mean, I seed them in pots, so. Someone is asking, this is a good question. They have a horse trough that they're using for a veggie bed. Do they, and this is probably true of any like raised bed, do they need to amend the soil from last year? Do those nutrients drain out through watering and rain throughout the year? What do you recommend for those raised bed types? Did you say a horse bed? A horse trough. 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 Okay. You know, those big metal um, containers that you <laughs> give horses water in. <laughs> so... So basically they grew something in it last year. Right, like, so it's a raised bed, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's like a raised, raised bed. I always amend my my raised beds every year. I just um, just give them some, you know, some fresh soil so they get some more nutrients. And then I would recommend testing it. <laughs> so um, at least checking the pH on it, if nothing else, and seeing if, you know, how healthy the soil is. Um, so I've, I've never grown anything in, in metal like that. My raised beds are um, wood. So mm -hmm. as long as it's properly drained and not contaminated with anything, I mean, I, I would think it would be fine, but I would amend it. Like I said, I amend my raised beds every year. So, okay. so you just add more uh, soil from... I add, yeah, I, I find that, you know, after I've had a couple of little crops in there, you know, throughout the year that you lose a lot of soil anyway, and um, they can either become too compacted. Mm -hmm. um, so I go in there and, you know, just rework the soil, add some fresh soil, you know, kind of like starting over. And then I fertilize, you know, individually. Well, actually, like I said, I generally test them and make sure, you know, so like if I'm making a bed of potatoes, which likes low pH, you know, then I make sure that that, that particular bed has the requirements for that plant. Um, so I don't, I try to keep like plants that like the similar soil conditions to together. But anyway, if I'm going to have to amend it in any way, I, I check it and I amend that bed individually for what's going in there. And then if I, I'm going to add additional fertilizer. I do it at planting. So. Okay. 
And you can uh, also grow a cover crop on your off season of um, uh, peas or fava beans and put some nitrogen back into the soil. I know some people have success with that to amend the soil from last year. Um, someone's asking how to test the uh, NPK on their raised beds. They did a rapid test from the hardware store, but it doesn't seem to be that good. It didn't seem to do what? It didn't seem to be that good, she stated. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, you know, in terms of how, how good. Uh, but how do you recommend testing for uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in your beds? Well, those little home soil tests are, I mean, about the only way for us home gardeners to 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 do it, at, you know, ourselves and expensively. The only other way to do it would be to um, take a, a sample to a lab, which is more expensive. And as um, well, my husband discourages me from doing because well, because it's expensive. And, you know, he says, he always tells me, my, my husband is an agronomist, so that's why I've, I can throw him under the bus here. So anyway, um, that if um, generally a lot of times a testing is more expensive than simply, you know, applying a fertilizer and, you know, most plants need some nitrogen and I'm not answering this question very well. But anyway, the, the ways to test it, like I said, those little home tests are about the only thing you have. There's also little meters you can get. I have one, uh, I have a pH meter and, um, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't give you nitrogen and that, that. So basically, yeah, those little home quick tests are taking it to a lab are the only ways you're gonna know for sure. Okay. And uh, someone did, did put in a question about cats uh, getting into your garden beds, but I see Kim has answered that in the chat. So thank you. And she put in a, she uh, said. a <laughs> link for how to, yeah, she's suggesting uh, they don't like newspaper and they won't dig through So laying down newspaper. So that's a good um, tip. Uh -huh. So um, also a couple of people wanted to know how to save the chat and you can save the links and the, and the chat by clicking on the three dots where you go to type your message. There's three dots to the right. And if you click on that, it will say save chat. So if you wanted to save the um, information in the chat, you can do that. And um, no new questions um, have come in. So I wanna remind everyone to um, go ahead and please click on the link for the evaluation. We really look forward to hearing from you. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of thank yous as well, Becky. So thank you for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome, it was fun. It said, you know, you guys did a great job, it says. So thank you for answering all our questions. And um, we thank you all for joining us. We're, get, we're a little new at this. I know a lot of people have been using Zoom. Um, and so uh, thank you for being there for us as we try out this new system that we've now just used a couple of times. So thank you, everyone. I think we'll sign off. And you can get the slides and the recording on our website. Um, probably it will take us um, about a week to get that up so you can check back and uh, revisit it. Okay, thank you. Bye.